And as I was telling you, so I really feel lucky to have done my EP training, arrhythmia training as well. Uh, my city was Maastricht, where uh, modern cardiac electrophysiology in the world started actually from Professor Heim Wellens. And that is literally just one hour distance from the city of Eindhoven. And as I said it to you, Eindhoven is the one who did the first ECG, in fact. There's also a what do we call it as? Uh, Eindhoven strangle. So we will try to show that. So what it actually measures is the potential difference of the electrical fields which is imparted by the heart. Dr. Yeah. Yeah. And now how is it? I, there was a lot of noise from the background actually. I think, was it your voice or was it someone else who were talking and all and we could hear? Okay, okay, wonderful, wonderful. Now, how is it? I can hear your voice clearly. Your voice I can hear very well. Okay, and now? Now it's better? Okay, good. Okay, wonderful. Uh, so... So what I was telling is, uh, what is ECG actually? The machine is, mo it's like an electromagnet, which can not only detect, but also record the changes in the electromagnetic potential. And like a typical, you know, magnetic pole, so it has a positive and also a negative pole as well. And both of them together constitute a lead. So that's why one of the, Important things is how to place those leads actually. Uh, so there are standard limb leads, atrial leads, esophageal leads, or of course the surface 12 lead ECG as well. And you can also extend them to the right side or the posterior side as well. So which I was talking about, those, so this is what is called as the Eindhoven strangle. So you need to be sure <coughs> what is the orientation of these leads. So, for example, the lead 1, lead 2, and lead 3. So, they come in alphabetical order, which you can see. So, lead 1, 2, and 3. So, positive is always across these three segments. Okay. So, it starts from 30, 60, 120, and, of course, 180. And above is all negative, below is all positive. So, that's the easy way to remember, as I said it. 1, 2, 3. Okay, so ECG, we had already discussed some of the fundamentals, but I'll try to give you an overall picture. So the P wave, QRS complex, the T wave, and then there are segments as well, which is called as the uh, ST segment, or here is called as the PR interval, or the QT interval as well. Uh, we should have a little bit of idea what is normal, what is abnormal. So the normal, as we all know, uh, is P wave tends to show the atrial activation, okay? And the PI interval is further. So what is the PI interval for? PI interval is for the intraatrial AV nodule and his Purkinje conduction. Similarly, the QRS complex is actually for the ventricular activation. And then comes is the QT. So what about the QT interval? So what is QT interval? So QT interval is, uh, it is actually related to the QT uh, heart rate as well. So this is the reason what is called as corrected QT interval. And corrected QT interval, how do you measure it? Is QT divided by root of R interval, which is called as the there is a formula for this, so which you can see it. And always remember, you should not take the measurements in milliseconds, but rather in seconds, if you want to uh, calculate the QT, uh, corrected QT actually. So ST segment, as you know, so this is more of the greater part of the ventricular repolarization. And comes the T wave, which is ventricular repolarization. And there are some doubts as well. So sometimes you may be able to see what is called as the U wave. Um, so it is mostly, they say like, it's mostly the negative after potential. 
And yes, it is more prominent when whenever you come across this short QT, then you see the U wave. This is how is the cardiac conduction system of the heart. As you may notice, there's the sinoatrial node, the master pacemaker, then comes the AV node, and then of course the SC node has its own conduction as well, how it goes around. So for example, right starts from the right atrium, goes down, and then spreads to the both the sides. So how about the resting membrane potential? How is it? So the resting potential is the SA node is of minus 55 millivolts and the Purkinje cell is of minus 95 and there's an active role of the sodium potassium pump. So whenever the transmembrane conduction it tends to uh, change the potential across the cell is going to change and on the basis of that those contractions tends to happen. So this is a very important figure in the sense you need to know what are those four different phases. Phase 0, 1, 2 and 3 and finally 4. So how it happens. So in the phase 0 is the inward sodium current then similarly in the phase 0 comes the calcium depolarizing inward current while phase 1 while phase 1 consists of the ITO current, which is potassium transient outward current, okay. Then comes is the calcium depolarizing uh, inward current and, and also the INACA as well. So these mem membrane currents, why are they important? Because on the basis of that, the transmembrane current is going to follow and finally the contraction or the relaxation may happen. So that's why they have a very big important role in fact. Then comes the phase 3. So which is characterized by potassium delayed rectifier current. And finally the phase 4 sodium pacemaker current like the potassium inward rectifier currents. So there is also something I think you all are aware of what is called as the cardiac ion channels. So these are transmembrane protein, proteins with specific conductive properties which can be voltage gated or ligand gated or even time dependent and they allow passive transfer of sodium, potassium, calcium or chloride ions across all cell membranes. So as I said it, if we are trying to understand a disease, a disease has uh, a much smaller molecular pattern as well. So if you're trying to understand long QT syndrome, you should be able to understand the cardiac action potential as well. And that's how the therapeutic targets for the antiarrhythmic drugs will also act upon. So that is why it is very, very important. So what are the various mechanisms of arrhythmias? So one of the first mechanisms is called as automaticity. In automaticity, what will happen is it tends to raise the resting membrane potential and also lowers the threshold potential, which happens in cases like hypokalemia, myocardial ischemia as well. And the second mechanism is called as triggered activity. Triggered activity is resultant from the oscillations in membrane potential after an action potential. So it can be either in form of early after depolarization or delayed after depolarization. So early after depolarization is, the example is TOSARDS. And delayed after depolarization is DD. Try to remember it like this. So digitalis. And the last type of the mechanism of uh, arrhythmia is re-entry. So for example, which is happening from slowed or blocked conduction. So when you are trying to classify arrhythmias on a wider basis, you can classify them in terms of wide complex tachycardia or narrow complex tachycardia. So wide complex tachycardia, as you all know, it includes ventricular tachycardia most commonly. Otherwise, also it may include as SVT with 
aberrancy otherwise someone may be having a pre-existing bundle branch block or even an accessory pathway so always remember how to how will you become really sure of the if it is vt or not so always ask most of those patients will be having a history of prior myocardial infarction or even structural heart disease otherwise left ventricular dysfunction as well however uh, and any problem is there any tachycardia is there so you can always try to also do some maneuvers so you should try to see for how do they respond to the adenosine or carotid sinus massage okay but you should not you should try to avoid giving a verapamil why you should try to avoid giving verapamil because if you give verapamil a lot of times they may deteriorate into vf then comes the ecg findings so what do you see on the vt as we have already spoken about it in our session about void complex tachycardia you may see capture or fusion beats av dissociation may be there as well so for example what do you see in this ecg so he notices this is more of a right bundle branch block right axis is left axis but when you start seeing carefully there are some p waves but av dissociation is present right so if av dissociation is present means it means is this is ventricular tachycardia similarly what about this ecg what do you notice if you come across a ecg like this so you notice is this is a left bundle branch left bundle branch and the axis is how is this axis and the biggest clue what you're going to get is when you see in the lead two the lead two there are fixed p waves so what it means is this is a supraventricular tachycardia but with aberrancy trying to give you a, a little overview of the narrow complex tachycardias so narrow complex tachycardias in include the simple tachycardias like the sinus tachycardia or maybe even atrial fibrillation or flutter or it also includes the reentrant tachycardias reentrant tachycardias like the av nodal or atrioventricular or even the intraatrial as well and the narrow complex tachycardias will also include as i had already said it the flutter which is so so how do you diagnose so one of the key things always is look for the atrial activity so for example try to see for the p wave whether the p wave is after the r wave or before the r wave so if the p wave is after the r wave so it will be avrt otherwise av and rt depending on the v interval or rp interval similarly as i had said it whenever you are in doubt always try to do some maneuvers so you can see give adenosine so adenosine what it will do is it will always most of the times it can terminate the most of the reintro tachycardias especially svts okay it may also uh, terminate some of the ventricular tachycardias as well but let's not get too much confused we can speak about those things later on however if the patient is compromised if the patient is unstable how do you see them so for example the patient will be presenting with heart failure hypertension or end organ dysfunction so you may sedate them or even cardioverted them or, or and also in the meantime try to see for what are the reversible causes so for example the oxygen level potassium level magnesium level if needed shock them again and start with an antiarrhythmic drug so for example one of the most common emergencies which we all come across is ventricular tachycardia so how do we see on the ecg you notice there are three consecutive ventricular ectopics with rate more than 100 minutes beats per minute similarly it is called as sustained vt when it is more than 30 seconds and of course prognosis is poor and you must intervene urgently and yeah if a patient is having slow vt 
you must treat them especially if they are unstable and to sorts you know what happens so as you can see in this diagram very well and this is accelerated idioventricular rhythm so this was recorded from a patient who had recently suffered myocardial infarction so during the infusion or thrombolysis therapy actually so coming to the vt management what do you do vt management always is try to see or correct for the reversible causes okay once you have taken care for that then you can try to use as lidocaine and then comes the magnesium and finally the easier to use is the amiodarone and you may also try to use the other antiarrhythmic drugs as well amiodarone is why is it preferred because the contraindications for amiodarone usage is very less so it should not be a problem so as i had said it atrial fibrillation management can also be one of the reasons when it can come and yes if the patient is very symptomatic Otherwise, with fast ventricular rate, you can give them a shock. And you do need to anticoagulate those patients. And maybe, if you can come across a reversible cause for this, try to treat as well. Always try to rule out the reversible causes whenever a patient tends to come to you with any arrhythmia problem, okay? So, uh, one of the other important things is, uh, if if it comes and presents to you with less than two days duration you can directly shock without anticoagulating them however if the patient comes with more than two days duration you must do rate control first okay and then give them anticoagulation and then elective DC cardioversion can be done Similarly, for the atrial flutter as well, atrial flutter, don't forget, atrial flutter needs to be anticoagulated like atrial fibrillation. And always remember, on a constant basis, its atrial rate is nearly 300 beats per minute. So whenever if you come across an arrhythmia with a rate of 300 beats per minute, always try to rule out atrial flutter. And of course, on the ECG, you will be able to see the ECG shows flutter waves. So this is the most uh, diagnostic sign of it. You may cardiovert them or even start them on antiarrhythmic drugs. Similarly, for the multifocal atrial tachycardia, you call them when the morphology of the P wave is more than three morphologies, actually. So how do you notice this? The PP and the PR interval is changing. So most of the times you come across in the cases of pneumonia. Okay. And you can always put them on a verapamil. So this is how you characteristically see the multifocal atrial tachycardias. Similarly, now the accessory pathways. We know they can be of different types. So, whenever you come across, always remember, don't start on beta blocker or cash channel blocker for accessory pathways. So, better is an anti-arrhythmic drug, something like flaconide or even amiodron can also be given for that. So, tachycardia is now you have a little bit of exam, uh, understanding. So, what about those bradyarrhythmias? So, bradyarrhythmias, always, if they're symptomatic, you have to treat them. So, how do you see it? Uh, like this so what happens is so what types of and uh, brady arrhythmias do you come across hi Sazia. yeah yeah tell me how many opd me who oh haha unko bully ka bat team bajay ke baad dekho ga unko haha unko just throw the Thank you so much. Thank you. Hello. So, what are so?
So, so what are the, so what was my question? So you all can always use the chat box to reply. So regarding the, if the patient is really symptomatic, you can always try to use his etropin. But always remember as well, um, yeah, in an emergency times, you can use etropin, but there can be uh, problems as well. If it is an intrahesian block, it may worsen the block as well. So that's why, uh, but on a normal basis, as I said it, okay, don't try to know too much. If you know too much, you will get confused as well. <laughs> So in an emergency basis, yes, bradyarrhythmias are there. You can think of using atropine or isoprenaline or, of course, do pacing as well for them. So this is what you see is complete heart block and atrial fibrillation. Why? So don't think that if you will be able to tell me the answer, I want to ask you the question. I'm going to ask you the question. So why will you call it as complete heart block and atrial fibrillation? Okay, so this is being called as atrial uh, complete heart block because RR intervals, when you will try to see, they are almost constant, right? So, so that's why it is complete heart block. But what else do you notice? So you notice this. There are fibrillatory waves, especially in the V1 or V2 as well when you see over there, right? So the patient is having fibrillatory waves. So that is why it is called as complete heart block and atrial fibrillation. So what is this arrhythmia? So what do you notice in this? What is this arrhythmia actually? So this arrhythmia, what do we notice actually? You know, there are some irregular beats initially. Then there is a premature ventricular complex. There's a, and then what this pattern is called as tosads. And what is the cause of VT actually? So if you would have seen carefully in that ECG, the reason was myocardial infarction. Anyways, now coming to this ECG, what do you notice? So I've given you a little bit of brief overview. What do you notice in this ECG? What is exactly happening? Why did I say hypokalemia? Why did I say that? Anyone would... No one would like to try, is it? Why did I say hypokalemia, actually? So what is happening over here? So why did I call it as a hypokalemia? See, this is very important. We need to, as I had said it, we need to be able to understand the mechanism as well. And if we don't understand, it's not good. Okay, uh, we will try to tell you a little bit more in the detail, okay? So what is, oh, okay, oh, I already give you the answer for this. ECG. So what is happening over here? If you'll notice carefully, the amplitude of the beats is changing, right? So this phenomenon is called as, this phenomenon is called as electrical alternance, okay? So this is diagnostic of sign of cardiac tamponade. Okay.